Hi, and welcome to Dear SQL DBA, a podcast for SQL Server database administrators and developers. I am Kendra Little from littlekendra.com, and I am also an advocate at Redgate Software. Today, doing an episode called three things that shouldn't be normal in database development. And I'm actually talking about a topic that I wrote about on the Redgate blog this week. It's inspired by a book called The Unicorn Project. The Unicorn Project is by Gene Kim, and it's published by IT Revolution, their book division. And they're doing a read-along right now, which is kind of like a summer book club. And this book is about uh, DevOps. So it's fiction, but it definitely has a nerdy theme. So if you're interested in book clubs, you're interested in software development, this might be something you actually want to join along. This is happening uh, now. It's currently July 2020, July 23rd to be exact. And the the we've just read chapters one through three, which are quite short. The book club's going to be continuing through August, so it's not too late to join in. They uh, post discussion topics on Twitter, and it's a fun thing. And also, I think I'm excited to read the book, The Unicorn Project. I'm actually spacing it out for myself and reading the book as it goes along. I'm kind of preventing myself from reading it all in one go. But so what I want to talk about is some of the things that I thought about after reading the first three chapters of The Unicorn Project, which, again, the book is by Gene Kim. I love Gene's work. I follow him on Twitter and attend his conferences when I can. I think he's a really interesting speaker and thinker and contributor to a lot of great DevOps things. He's also been a contributor to the Accelerate uh, State of DevOps report over multiple years. Really, really uh, interesting researcher as well as the things I've talked about. So in the first three chapters of the Phoenix Project, I'm not going to give you two, not the Phoenix Project, I just said that, the Unicorn Project. I'm not going to give you too many spoilers, but here's the background. There's a previous book called The Phoenix Project, which you may or may not have read. It is fine if you haven't read The Phoenix Project book. You don't have to read it to read The Unicorn Project, but there is, like, the story continues. So this is a sequel, but you don't have to have read the earlier version. In the Unicorn Project, there is a project going on called the Phoenix Project, right? That kind of refers to things that started in the prior book, but you don't have to like go back and read the whole book. So what happened at the beginning of the Unicorn Project book is we've got a a character named Maxine. And Maxine is a smarty. Maxine is a senior developer and architect and... Something kind of enraging happens when Maxine comes back to work. I have to admit, as I started to read the book, I was just really mad. And I was kind of like, maybe I don't like this company at all based on how they're treating Maxine. <laughs> get, I'm trying to get over that. I'm seeking, I'm seeking therapy to calm myself down over the bad treatment of Maxine. But what happens is, because of an unfortunate series of events... And Maxine being blamed for things she didn't do. Maxine is reassigned to what's called the Phoenix Project. And the Phoenix Project is something that in the part of the business Maxine has been working in, the Phoenix Project isn't seen with envy and admiration. It's really seen as a place where good ideas go to die. (laughs) And this is something that, you know, in various places I've worked at in the past. This actually isn't re- it's true for where I work now. But I have absolutely worked in places in the past where there's other things going on in the organization. And you're like, I really don't want to have anything to do with that. <laughs> this is bad news, right? So this is Maxine is reassigned to like the thing that she never wanted to have anything to do with. And she goes and joins them. And as she joins them, she finds these signs of trouble. What we learn about this is when Maxine joins the project, she finds that they don't have a standard development environment that people can use. So here's a quote. It takes months for new developers to do builds on their laptops and be fully productive. In fact, we've had some new contractors on site for weeks 
and they can't even check in code yet. That's what one of Maxine's new teammates tell her. And she's really concerned about this because one of the things Maxine has learned over her career, here's another quote, is that when people can't get their build going consistently, disaster is usually right around the corner. Now, this was really interesting to me because one of the first jobs that I had in IT was I joined a, what was called a build operations team in IT. And when I joined, I didn't know what a build was, <laughs> which is fine. Um, but a lot of database people, here's a, like the topic of this episode is three things that shouldn't be normal in database development. And that's related to this. A lot of database folks don't know what builds are because they don't have that capability. So I was thinking about reading this book and it's being pointed out like, oh, it's a sign of trouble when people can't get the build to work consistently. And I'm like, well, it's an even worse sign when the build doesn't exist. <laughs> right? Like a failing build is a sign of problems. But what is it a sign of if you don't even have the expectation that you should have a build? And so that got me started thinking about the three things that I think shouldn't be normal in database development. And these all kind of correlate to what I learned in reading through these first three chapters of the, the Unicorn Project. So what, I mean, I don't want to start with builds there. I want to step back a little bit too, because what do we need to do a build? Like to even explain what is build, what am I building, right? <laughs> I'm building code. Well, in order to set up automated builds of code, there's a, a really common foundation that's used for this. And that foundation is a version control system. The way that we can work towards getting a build set up and getting successful automated build set up is the very first thing we would do is to make sure to get our code into a version control system, something like Git. Maybe it's GitHub, maybe it's a Git repo hosted in GitLab, maybe it's in Azure DevOps, maybe it's you know somewhere else. It doesn't have to be Git either. Git is just simply the most common one used these days. It could be perforce, it could be other things, it could be subversion. But the first step is to get our code into version control, but this is not something that everyone has when it comes to databases. A lot of databases don't have nice things, unfortunately. We do a survey each year at Redgate called the State of Database DevOps Report. And one of the questions we've asked actually for several years is, you know, whether or not you're using version control for database code. And the 2020, right, so this is the most recent 2020 report, shows that 44% of respondents do not use version control for database development. So the majority of people are using, the majority of at least respondents to this survey are using source control, but it's not a huge majority. I don't... 56% doesn't necessarily make something normal to me. Like normal would be more like 70% and above. We all have different definitions of normal, I think. But there's a lot of people <laughs> not using, 44% not using version control for their database development. So if you're not using version control for your database development, what are you doing? Well, you're most likely using something like a database, you know, maybe you're using a database that you make it look like you want stuff to look, and then you use a tool like a comparison tool to, to automatically generate a change. Maybe use it to deploy it. Maybe you store that script in a file share. That might be what you're doing. But version control is never involved in there. Or you might be doing something like saving off scripts that are going to update the database that could be generated in a variety of ways, either handwritten or some other method, saving those in a file share. Um, maybe you're attaching scripts to a ticket, right? But all of these are methods where we can't really share these changes. We can't really have multiple people generating these changes and reviewing them with each other in a, in a very sensible way, right? It's We're either generating our changes at the very last minute prior to deployment in a way that we can't really do a lot of validation with, hey, what are you thinking about doing over there? Or, and we also can't 
easily build our changes and we can't create a lineage as to who did this change, right? Like if there's 10 changes in the database, who checked in each one and what were they for, right? That all gets lost in this whole process there. So version control has multiple benefits for, for not just for databases, for all types of development. With version control, we can share our changes in a really clear, organized way with one another. And it has much lower risk, right? With all of the methods I described, like this whole thing of like make a database look like we want it to look and then deploy from that. What if I make a change to that database that I forget about? I, how do I even review all the changes that have been done in there? It only can happen at the last minute after I generate that deployment script. But if four of us have been making changes to that database, maybe I just think, oh, it must have been Grant who did that change. Or maybe that was Kathy who did that change. Totally, this would be a total Kendra thing to do. Totally forgetting that it was me who did it. If I'm using version control, it's really obvious to me <laughs> where things came from. There's not only clear ways to share things, there's this clear lineage. And also with version control, we can merge changes in from each other's branches and resolve conflicts in a really clear way where we can see, oh, two of us changed this. Here's the changes I want. Here's the changes Kathy wanted. Maybe we should have both. Or maybe we should have Kathy's and not mine, right? But I can very clearly make that decision. But also, and this is really important, it sets the groundwork for early validation like build and automated tests. So not only are there all the benefits we've talked about, but we're getting back to this whole thing of when I join a team, it's really beneficial. The character Maxine is pointing out is hugely beneficial to be able to perform a build of the whole environment and to have these productivity tools. So what is a build? If I've got my code inversion control, no matter what tooling I'm using, right? I'm going to, with a database, I'm going to have to have some sort of tooling to translate between what's in version control and what are we going to deploy to the database, right? Maybe it's free tooling, maybe it's paid tooling. There's a variety of tools available, but you do like, you have to have some sort of way to translate between, okay, I've got this in version control and here's what I'm going to deploy. Whatever tooling you are using, you want to be able to use it to say, here is the code I've got in version control. Is this valid code? And this is important <laughs> because, you know, I've worked in places even where we had the code in version control, but we didn't have an automated build, right? And a lot, this is true for a lot of people. So here's another, the, the, just a review. The previous stat was that 44% of folks say, ah, we aren't using version control for the database. How many people are not using builds? 73% of people are not using builds for their database code. So that means that even if you, you know, some of these people are using version control, but they aren't using a build. Well, you, you want that build in place to validate that code. I, I've worked in some places where we were doing it. We had it in version control, but we didn't have the build. And I would get code handed to me to deploy to a staging environment. And I would go to, we did have some automated tooling to run the code, but I'd go to run it and it wouldn't even compile. So we could have fixed this that the, with the tooling that we had. We could have fixed this by automating a process whereby any time a change was made, anywhere in this code, we would automatically run a deployment against an environment, <laughs> right? We could have built in automated validation that the code was good. And then we, we could have made it even possible, even more sophisticated, even more better, more better being the best way to explain this. We could have made it prove not only does the code deploy, but then also we could check how long does the deployment take? Is the state at the end of the deployment, does it look like we expect it to look? We could have built in tests for that, right? We could have built a variety of things on top of that. But the very base of this is an automation that checks the validity of the code that you have checked into source control. So 
of respondents to the database DevOps report says they don't have that. And this is something that really helps people be more productive. If you can set up an automated way to validate the code that's going to be able to be deployed, then this helps people get started much more quickly, helps people share your changes much more quickly. Now you might be thinking, but wait, Kendra, you have described some ways where sometimes the code is automatically generated. How could that code be invalid, right? Is it, aren't we, if the code that we're deploying with is automatically generated, right, what is the point of a build? There's still a point to a build. It's a good, good question. So the tooling out there, so here's some examples of tooling that sort of automatically generate this code for you. Uh, one example is, well, Redgate has one, uh, SQL source control with SQL change automation. This uses a what's called a state-based method of deployment that will store what you want things to look like in the database, and it will automatically generate deployment code for you. Similarly, Microsoft database projects, their SSDT database projects, they do something quite similar as well. All of this tooling that I've described also has a build functionality <laughs> so that it can build the code. It Yes, it, automatic, it generates it automatically, but it does do build functionality with it to make sure that it's valid. And there's a couple of reasons for this. I think the simplest reason for this is that even a machine can make mistakes. Right? You might run into an edge condition where it just can't come up with the right code. I'm not saying that's common. I'm not saying it's even something I've seen. I'm saying computers are like that. <laughs> but there's another thing too, is that we are also allowed with a lot of this tooling to introduce scripts that we have written as well. Maybe it's something like a pre-deployment script or a post-deployment script or some other customization that we're working in there. Yeah, we can introduce errors. <laughs> we want to build for those reasons as well. There's also, um, when you get really into this, there's things like dependencies that matter. There's all sorts of other reasons you want to do this. So even if most or all of the code is automatically generated, I would argue there is still a lot of reason to have a build in there. And that's why organizations that build tooling around this provide you with recommendations or a way to run a build for this. Even if you're using tooling, like I said, that doesn't have a built-in build component, you can create a validation yourself by deploying against a scratch environment or an empty environment, right? So it doesn't have to be that the tooling has something called, this is a build, a lot of it does, but even if it doesn't, you can provide or work on build-like functionality yourself. So those are the first two things that it should, it should not be normal or Let's, let's turn this around. What are the things that should be normal for database development that aren't? It should be normal to use version control, just like with any other code, right? Right now, it's only just a little bit above half. It should be normal to have automatic builds running for your database code. Right now, it's only 27% who have that. The third thing is that it should be normal to be able to set up database development environments quickly. We asked folks, how many folks are using automated database provisioning? 79% of people responded that they are not using automated database provisioning. More than three quarters of people lack the ability to automatically provision databases. Now this, might come off as a sales pitch. It's not meant as a sales pitch. Like, yeah, I work for a company that does make tooling that helps with this. However, <laughs> ever since I became a database administrator, long, long, long ago, around that time I worked on that built environment, the dream was that we would be able to automatically provision databases. Like this is not a new idea. This is something that virtualization and SAN companies have been working on developing tech for and selling for a very long time and for very good reasons. Being able to set up a lightweight environment to do your work in that is quality means that you are less likely to make errors, 
right? You have a way where you can deploy to a realistic environment and it's not a big deal to set it up. It's not a big deal to wipe it out. This really, really is just an extremely useful thing for getting people on a team up and running quickly and also empowering people on a team to be able to build automatic validation. Because yes, for a build, I to test, is, is my code, does my code compile, right? Is my code syntactically correct? I can deploy to an empty environment in some cases. It doesn't have to have a bunch of data in it or anything like that. However, in order, like in the real world with databases, there are going to be times where I want to be able to quickly reset an environment and say, ah, what if I ran the code this way? How long would this take to deploy to a realistic production-like database, right? Is this something that deploys in 10 minutes or 10 seconds? I can't tell that against an empty database. I need something that is more realistic for that. But I also don't want it to be an environment that is so special and so rare that I can't experiment with it. If it takes a week to reset a database environment, even if it takes two days to reset a database environment, and that slows down other people's work, that is a huge problem. So this should be something that we invest in to make things easier. And I say like this should be because having worked at a variety of different companies, I know how much people spend on fancy storage tech. It's easy to spend a lot on fancy storage tech. And a lot of what actually blocks people from using this is silos between team and lack of communications. I'm getting a little passionate about this. So I am like adding plurals on words that shouldn't have plurals. I've, I've, when I was a consultant, I would sometimes work at companies that had, you know, problems with development in very large databases. And I would ask about, some of the tech that was already owned in-house. Like, oh, I see, I see you're using this very expensive SAN. Do you have the feature that allows you to create writable snapshots? Sometimes the answer would be, oh yeah, it turns out we do have that feature. Well, well why can't it, why doesn't anyone use them? And the answer would often be that there, the SAN team didn't have time to kind of deal with this on a ticketing and request basis, which is valid. Like the same team shouldn't spend all of their time answering tickets and, you know, like manually doing things. They do have strategic things to do. But basically no one had invested in finding a way to set up self-service. That might be the SAN team that runs that project. That might be someone else. But the whole idea is how do you use your resources widely and actually set up the ability to set up development environments quickly for everything, including the database. So this is what I was thinking about in reading these first three chapters of the Unicorn Project. The three things that I think, the, the book points out that these should be normal for development environments. And, and I think some people may read the Unicorn Project and be like, yeah, those people in that story, our life isn't like that. You know, they're they're really doing it wrong. Of course you should be able to set up a build. But the thing is, I think a lot of people when they when they think about things like version control and they think about things like build, what they they don't actually think about their whole environment. They simply think of the lowest hanging fruit, which is the application code. And I'm not saying that application development is easy. I'm saying that is the area where in software development we have made the most progress. Right? It is normal to expect that application code should be in version control. That is normal. It is normal to think of that as having builds, but we have allowed it to become really normal for databases to not have nice things over the years. <laughs> so much so that it can be hard for people to even realize that it could be different. Like you're so used to not having tools to help you validate your software code that we, you just, you live without them. <laughs> and that means that when new people join the team, it takes them a very long time before they can get to the point where they can write a database change. It means that when you need to make a database change, it's much slower to be deployed. It means that you have fewer tools to catch quality issues 
in the code well before it releases and that you're more likely to end up in this oh, well, what is our, what do we do when something goes wrong? Well, we get called on the carpet and get told not to do it again. And that's everyone then fears making changes to the database, right? This is the old cycle. It doesn't have to be that way. It really can be quite different. It can be just as good and productive as we can make the software development lifecycle for application services, right? It can be much, much better. So I think it's a huge opportunity. Um, I'm not, I'm not saying this because I'm not, I don't want to say, oh, you're bad for not having done this. It's not that at all. The The reason I get so excited about this is like, it can be so much better for you. Like you have such an opportunity to improve things in this area and just make work more fun. The teams that I work with who are investing in doing things like saying, we are going to make it so that we can create and get rid of environments as we need them. And we are going to make it so that we can do automated testing for these. We are going to have builds in addition to the automated tests. It's rare, I don't know if there's anyone who does tests but don't do builds. It's usually first builds, then tests. But these folks tend to be also people who say, we want our people to be creative. We don't want people to work super long hours. We want people to be able to deploy during the workday. We want deployments to be boring. We want to get to the point where we're so good at this that actually the point at which the code goes out, nobody nobody even has to really know about it because it's so boring because everything that comes before that helps make sure that nothing is going to go wrong. We want instead of being worried about a deployment to spend a lot of our time thinking more about architecture decisions and um, where we want to move to and how we can do that safely. And these teams do tend to be uh, fun to work with as well. So I think moving in this direction and getting out of the, you know, kind of fear around deployments, it's a huge opportunity to not only be able to do software development better, but in moving in this direction, what I've observed is it makes the quality of life for the people working on these changes better as well, in my experience. So a lot of very positive things about it. Please do, if you are listening to this episode soon, please do consider reading the Unicorn Project and checking out Unicorn Project Read Along. There is a hashtag on Twitter. You can check out Unicorn Project Read Along and find out more about it. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Dear Sequel DBA. I'm Kendra Little, and I'll see you again in another episode. Bye, folks.